Okay. It's good. Friends, we are now here to talk about April 2024 with our good friend David Bishop from Brick Meet Click. My name is Mark Fairhurst, and I am the Chief Growth Officer at Mercatus. It's a pleasure to see you again, David. Hey, good to see you, Mark. Listen, we've got uh, another month to, to wrap up. Can't wait to dig into it, and I do have some questions I want to ask you. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Give us the headline, and then we can, we can dive into oh, well, how, whatever, how, whatever strikes our fancy. Well, why, why don't we just mix it up here? What, what were some of the top of mind questions you have? And again, I don't know what you're going to be asking me, so why don't you just kick it off, Mark, I mean, besides the top line? So let, I want to talk about the shift in, in consumer behavior that, that we're sure. still witnessing, and specifically the, um, the number of active households. Looking at the mass retailer and the supermarket segment, and I'm curious, what primary factors do you think are con contributing to this shift? Each month, not a lot changes. So some of the, the points, if, if we brought them up in the past, mm -hmm. maybe repeated here. But, you know, I think first and foremost, Walmart and the mass, which would include Target, have been well positioned since the pandemic and before mm -hmm. the pandemic to, you know, support and satisfy online demand better than most other formats. And, and that's still true today. They're, they're running at a rate that's just incredible. I, I did some back the envelope math based on some published numbers from Walmart and basically concluded that Walmart on a per store basis <laughs> is generating as much uh, is generating more orders per store day just for delivery than the equivalent weekly total orders done by a supermarket for delivery and pickup. So, you know, we're talking so, almost a 10, a 10 time so, difference. So, so in, when you say supermarket, what's, what's that supermarket? Well, Typical I mean, regional? regional, regional grocer, local grocer, but in essence, Walmart's volume on a weekly basis, if you want to look at it that way, is almost 10x that on an yeah. order basis than the, the supermarkets. And so that that level of volume at a per store basis really creates a powerful flywheel or virtuous cycle so. that allows them to staff up and, and improve aspects that others struggle with because they don't have the volume, right? Well, I, I rec you know, I recently read an article in Grocery Dive that uh, had asked you about subscription models. To what extent do you think uh, the subscription or membership models are really driving that volume? If, if is it sub significant, substantial? First of all, if you're on the the Walmart app and you're not a Walmart Plus member yet, it's it's hard to avoid it. It's the first thing that pops up when you open the app. It also pops up right during the checkout process when you're, you know, picking your times for delivery. And again, let's keep in mind, Walmart Plus is, is <clears throat> focused on delivery. And part of the reason for that is most of their pickups, assuming they're over $35, is free. So there's not really an opportunity to leverage it with pickup. But they are doing a really good job putting it front and center at the moment of truth for customers. And let's keep in mind, they offer a 30 day free trial. So that's a no risk offer. I did it by accident once I kind of blew my my free trial. I didn't even use it. But the point is, that's 30 days you can use it. And then again, any anybody who's a, a, a savvy customer would say, OK, I just did mine. Honey, why don't you log in, set it up under your phone number and let's get another 30 day trial. So one of the things you and I think talked about kind of offline was a phenomenon that we've seen in streaming services where people talk about the binge walking, uh, uh, watching <laughs> cycle, but also how they use that to Ish. maximize, you know, their time on that subscription. And, you know, my daughters do this. They'll go one month on Hulu, watch the shows, turn it off, then go one month on Disney Plus. Uh, and they take the advantage of the... They take advantage of the of the offers to, to yeah, rinse, come back. Rinse win and back, repeat, win backs. Right. Yeah. Right, right. So now on the grocery side, you know, if you you have multiple people in the household, you can continue that shell game, if you will, avoiding the, the payment for a, a fairly good period. And if it's not staying with Walmart, then, you know, there's plenty of third party offers out there from the 
from from the the people who are trying to build market share, whether it's DoorDash or Uber Eats or, and of course, Instacart's trying to yeah. you know wall off the defense. So there's so much out there in terms of incentives towards a focus on delivery that they're, that that they're just being incentivized through that lack of a better term a subsidy that you know when that wears off then you know we can read the tea leaves a little more clearly but i don't think that's necessarily going to uh, evaporate anytime so, soon because it has proven effective in your estimation if you were on it three or four times so those subsidies will eventually work to keep the customer coming back and paying full rate well, again, keep in mind, 30 days is going to allow most of these customers to complete two purchase cycles because, again, we're seeing on average a little north of two, what, 2.4 orders per month. And that's not just delivery or pickup. That's everywhere. So, you know, having a 30 day offer, not everyone does. For instance, Target offers it as a 14 day offer. And most supermarkets may not even have a trial offer. They may just mm-hmm. simply use, hey, your first three delivery orders, there's no, we're going to waive the delivery fee. So they approach it differently, right? As opposed to kind of a time stamped uh, trial, they do it based on the number of orders. Both ways are effective in, in bringing those people in to use the service. The, the challenge is retaining those customers who were purely motivated by the deal. But again, at the same time, it's that those subscriptions aren't necessarily intended to attract customers as much as it is to motivate the single order customer to a second order because that's where the payback starts to accrue. And then secondarily, it's also intended to be a retention strategy to protect your more frequent customers because anyone who's placing two orders a month with the banner already sees immediate payback and benefit by just signing up because they're going to save just without changing any of their past behaviors. They can still place two orders. Now they save money or they place three, they save even more. So from that standpoint, it's been very effective. And we've seen only a few uh, regional grocers, you know, embrace subscriptions based on rationale like that. And even more so fewer who have actually targeted pickup. There are some regional grocers who have a subscription that doesn't target simply delivery, but also looks at pickup. And that's where we believe there is an opportunity for all the other regional grocers is to say, hey, how and where can we apply this to pickup? Now, obviously, if you offer free pickup, that's a non-starter because there's not a benefit for doing so. But most regional grocers do offer pickup at a fee. And so, Right there, you have the ability to do that. And at the same time, you also have the ability to introduce other you know, price tiers, primarily around what people consider express services. We just consider expedited services. We see that as another opportunity where you can still generate a revenue on the fee for the expedited service while still waiving the standard fee for pickup or delivery and we're seeing that play out as well. But yeah, yeah subscriptions yeah. are playing a, a big role of it. But, you know, Walmart's focus on growing their delivery business, which, by the way, is first party distributed for the most part. And where it's not, they're working through their gig network, part of Spark, and, and in some cases, DoorDash, I believe, to fulfill those express orders. So you mentioned there's just a handful or maybe two regionals that are actually have viable well, subscription programs. If if you were a regional looking into, into doing this, what would you say would be critical or key to putting into that program? First and foremost, you know, let's check the boxes. Do you have pickup? Yes. Okay. Second of all, do you charge a fee for pickup? If yes, okay, you continue on. As you look at that then, you would probably want to look at your customer base and just look at the order distribution on a monthly basis to see, Mm -hmm. you know, on a distribution chart, you know, what share of your customers are placing one order a month versus two or more. The two or more will help you understand the value from the retention side. The one only, and this is one a month, would then help you dimensionalize what the potential Lyft would be associated with motivating a second purchase from those. But beyond that, you could be looking further at your infrequent customers, those who lapsed this month, but maybe were active last month, and maybe they're every other month. 
that the subscription could be a way to engage them in a more frequent basis so that they aren't lapsing every other month and, and changing their behaviors. But we have heard firsthand from the retailers who have those subscriptions that they believe, I haven't seen the, the data or the evidence to support the claim, but they believe that it is helping protect mm-hmm. their more frequent customers and not giving that customer a reason to consider to go elsewhere. Yeah. a rival is worth something because we know that, that that person who's buying more frequently tends to be <clears throat> a customer who's been with you more uh, for a longer period of time. And, and if that's the case, we know that those customers generally pay or, or spend 40% or more on an order basis compared to those first timers. So there is incredible value in protecting those more frequent customers while trying to find ways to just move the needle on the, the less frequent or lighter shoppers. And it, and it really does underscore understanding your, your customer base, segmenting them, modeling those households, understanding their, their purchase frequency, and, and more importantly, what's in their basket. Um, so you can send them the right offers at the right time to incentivize them to repeat purchase. And another thing I'd add, Mark, is, and you know this better than I do, one of the major pushes over the last couple of years was really the integration of EBT Snap online, mm-hmm. right? And where we see that coming to play in subscriptions is whether those retailers who do offer s- subscriptions offer a discounted rate for households who are on government assistance, mm-hmm. right? Someone like Walmart does. But most regional grocers have not yet offered that up. Or if they do, it's not readily apparent because I haven't seen it in the recent research that I've been doing on behalf of a a regional retailer. So having the subscription is a step in the right direction. Having tiers is another. And a great example is you can look at Kroger. Now, this isn't around the government assistance, but they offer uh, two subscriptions. They have a same day subscription, and then they have a next day subscription. Both are again targeting delivery, but the next day subscription is less expensive than the same day. So they're playing to, you know, the focus on when someone wants it as a way to delineate the fee structure, which we mm-hmm. believe is a, a best practice. And they're doing it in a unique way that we haven't seen others do. But again, we have only a handful of regional retailers who offer are who are also offering a subscription, but just not against delivery, but also pickup. But in that case, it's because they also had a fee. And so, again, you can see a lot of creativity out there. There may not be broad awareness for who those retailers are. And that's part of the challenge for others is to be able to identify and and examine what those retailers are doing or maybe even talk with them. Any any sense as to uh, if that strategy is working? At Kroger? You know, I, I don't have any firsthand conversations with them on that. I, I'm pointing it out simply because it does recognize an important <clears throat> aspect that we also highlight in a different way, which is the recognition that not all customers want the fastest delivery. And, you know, convenience shouldn't be simply defined based on speed or acceleration, but rather on when they want it, which is precision, um, yep. and we still see that. But you can, if you listen to the last quarterly call of Instacart, you would hear them or read their quarterly letter, and you would see that they really do define convenience as associated with delivering faster to the customer, but that's their model. But I yep. think where regional grocers are beginning to establish a foothold, at least, is recognizing that you know, convenience is about getting it when I want. And when I want it, it has to be juggled with how much am I willing to to pay for that convenience, right? Yeah. So having the options simply gives the customer more freedom or flexibility or control and also empowers them to find ways to save money. And the saving money part is becoming so pronounced to me in the work that we're doing, whether it's in-store or online, the more places you can showcase or show where and how you help your customer save money with you, I think the more 
appreciative they'll be of those tactics because everyone likes to feel as though they're getting a good deal. Now, everyone knows if you want the best deal, well, you probably go somewhere else. But we're not trying to tell someone, hey, go down the street, right? This We've had this conversation before, it's the, and it links to this idea of precision. Precision has a value connotation to it, right? The cus- consumers want it when they want it, and they're willing to pay a certain price for it. And all of this this goes into this calculus behind, you know, how, how, how does that individual household or shopper define value? Well, you think just think of it very practically. I'm the consumer or I'm the customer. I placed an order and it's for later today. It's delivery. They give me the, the time window again. It could be anywhere from three hours, like, oh, my God, three hours. That's terrible to oh, one hour, which is better, but still not great. Because, again, as we've talked about before, well, I can't leave the house because it's probably not unattended, especially if there's alcohol in it. Even if it is unattended, I may not want to leave the house. If it has temperature sensitive items, think ice cream. For all those reasons, even a one hour window with continued real time updates creates a little bit of stress because oh, I can't take a shower yet or I can't go walk the dog or I can't run other errands because I need to be around. Pickup is different. Now, pickup, you'll still place the order. You'll get your window. Maybe it's one hour or 30 minutes. But the kicker is you'll get a notification. And sometimes that notification comes before your window. Generally, it does. And it yeah. says, your order's ready. Now, let's say it's one o'clock and my window is three to four. The note says, your order's ready. Come pick it up at any time. So I'm no longer confined to, mentally confined to my one hour window. And so I can go earlier. I can go during it or I can go later. Now, from a retail standpoint, that creates some challenges for operations because now we don't know when that demand is going to be fulfilled. That's right. From the customer standpoint is, hey, you know, life happens. Things change. Oh, Johnny's sick. I got to go to the school now. You know what? I'll go do that and I'll pick this up now. So now it's kind of a combining of various trips. So it creates more control for it gives well, the customer more control and, right and it, and again in that scenario i mean something comes up you, at least you know the order is at the at the grocery store in its you know staged state and you know the the, the chilled or the frozen product are probably in the in the refrigerator or the freezer right. as, as required so you, you're not under the gun to go get yeah. it yeah as opposed to og oh, i gotta yeah. go get my kid or yeah. put the ice cream in the freezer it's a which one? It's a Sophie's yeah. choice. Do I save yeah. the kid or do I save the ice cream? Oh, <laughs> for me, that'd be a real toss up. Um, you know, it'd be a hassle to go get a, a new uh, ice cream. My kid's going to still likely be there. He's still yeah, in they'll school. They'll come back. So. They'll come. They'll so, come back. You know, but, 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 then, but then I have to deal with the aftermath of the kid maybe blowing up and having a, a fit. So those are all the kind of the social calculus items that people are going to be thinking about. Father of the father of the year. (laughs) Oh yeah. Yeah, (laughs) totally. Well, they're, they're both out of high school. They're not at home. So there's no uh, child parenting issues in my household anymore. So they're all fully functioning citizens. Okay. So Dave, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about the news that dropped this week, which was this interesting pairing between our friends at Instacart and Uber, specifically Uber Eats and how Uber Eats is now going to be accessible via the marketplace. What are your, what are your thoughts on this? You know, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, you can look at it any number of ways, right? I mean, from a pragmatist perspective, I see, you know, Uber has incredible reach into to restaurants and in their people current in business, but they're still trying to penetrate grocery. You yep. know that as well as I yep. do. They have a few on there, but it's nowhere near what an Instacart has. And of course, DoorDash is really getting aggressive building market share and in really grocery. spending their way yes. yeah, in grocery to get there. You know, for Uber, Uber could be, this is all speculative, could be signaling that maybe they're not going to go as aggressively into grocery as originally thought, because if they were tying up with Instacart would become more complicated. But at the same time, you know, they were asked point blank, I think it was on Bloomberg, both yeah. Fiji and um, whom Adara 
were asked about merging and they said, well, you know, just given the climate and likely the antitrust considerations, a strategic partnership seemed more feasible. So it's not to say that they couldn't merge, but to me, it would indicate maybe Uber is going to become less aggressive in pursuing grocery. I mean, they acquired grocery uh, corner shops. So a few years back, so it's you know, kind of figuring out from, what to do with it. But I mean, for, from a provider, like I mean, as a first party provider company, it's, it's, door, it's a DoorDash and Instacart game and more so DoorDash of late, I can tell you that. Yeah. And so I think for Uber, Uber is looking at, hey, you know, we pretty much fished our pool for restaurants with our customers. So let's open up our pool to someone else who can do some fishing in there with grocery. And that would be Instacart. So, you know, they're basically saying we'll, we'll host our, our customers on Instacart. And if that customer buys something, Instacart will capture the order and then Uber will fulfill it. Right. So there's some divisional labor and obviously Instacart benefits with an affiliate or a referral fee. So, you know, they're monetizing their reach into a new customer pool that may have less overlap with Uber as a way to help Uber expand more effectively. And so, I mean, look at the cost to acquire a new customer. I mean, I don't know how much that is today. Is it a hundred bucks, so, $150, right? So let me add, and, is, it, is this a positive or a negative for regional grocers? Well, if I'm a regional grocer, I'm thinking, well, how does this help me? Well, mm -hmm. all this does is it gives the people who are on the marketplace more places to shop. It's like the mall. So that's more competition. More competition is not what I want to see if mm -hmm. I'm the retailer, because there's just simply more choices. And this is a, a trip mission that grocers have been actually doing well with recently with the spat of inflation, especially with food away from home, that grocers have been winning some of the food away home dollars with their prepared foods. And maybe that's being fulfilled through DoorDash as opposed to you know someone else. So if I'm a grocer, I'm not necessarily enthused by this, but if it strengthens what Instacart does for me and how I work with them, then maybe it's really a ho-hum thing for me, right? Okay, so maybe maybe a neutral, a neutral. But on yeah. this, I want, but I want, I want to ask you about another piece of news that dropped that yeah. you and I had offline, at least it exchanged a few messages about, was this Instacart's deal with NBC Universal uh, yeah. and their streaming and linear broadcast services, connecting household data to viewership. What's, what That's what do you think is going on there? Again, you know, streaming as an industry is struggling with profitability. It's extremely competitive today. So they have this price war going on for viewers and mm -hmm. every one of their brother. Uh, my, my daughter just got a new T-Mobile mobile phone and with it, she got free streaming for Netflix. We already have it. And then for one other service, right? So there's obviously that component, but you know, when there's a big hit out there, and I think Peacock, you, you watch Peacock, Mark, and there may be a big show that, you know, is must watch. There's, well, what, there's maybe one, okay, one or well, two. That, that's about it. That's all it takes. That's all it yeah. takes. With Amazon and uh, Thursday Night Football, that's all it took. One game yeah. a week and people yeah. signed up. And that was a huge boost for Amazon because if you wanted to watch Thursday Night Football, you got to have Prime. That was a powerful hook. And so I think Peacock had some hot shows that would have motivated someone to say, ah, Instacart's deal's good, but now that they added the streaming service, oh, that's really interesting because I haven't tried Peacock. There's some things I get free Peacock, right? And then I can use the service. And again, there's a 30-day trial even with Instacart's you know, membership program. So if someone doesn't like it, well, they're not out anything. So I think that had a, pet, uh, a positive lift, but the question is, how permanent is that, given the, the well, shifts in the behavior? I'm, I'm, I'm also, what are the economics of this deal? You know, Mark, for people who generally put profit over sales, which are grocers versus the technology, which had typically put sales over profit, I don't know what the financial arrangements are. I'm assuming it makes sense, but that assumption is not always a, a wise one to make. You, you have 
competing interests. You have a streaming service who's trying to attract viewers and keep viewers, and you have a you know a third party delivery provider who's essentially trying to do the same thing. You know, well, it remains to be seen. You know, and how a delivery, sticky uh, that is. And a delivery provider who's offering to model household purchase behavior. You can argue with those Instacart customers or those, you know, a regional supermarkets customers, and and then also you know monetize the that audience uh, as far as a, a third party media company. Yeah, goes. I think you know the concern I would have, or I would point to, you know, using a healthy dose of skepticism is if it takes having the streamer service to attract new users, what does that say about our service and our dependence on these type of tactics? Again, that arrangement really doesn't make sense if Peacock doesn't have anything that customers want. So now you're dependent on the ability for Peacock to fill their pipeline with quality content that drives viewers to Peacock. And if so, then that continues to strengthen Instacart's offer. If it doesn't, then what's the point, right? And it goes both ways. Um, I mean, I don't think we see Peacock trying to say, you know, subscribe to Peacock and get free Instacart. So they're not the initiators of this. I think it's one more bell and whistle that they hang on there. At at the heart of it, though, in the way we look at it with the regional retailers is when we look at the membership and subscription programs, at least for our purposes, looking at its impact on the way we shop, We look at the benefits that are specific to grocery related purchasing. So in that context, Peacock doesn't have any financial benefit for that. It has another user benefit, but it's not a core benefit to the value prop that Instacart continues to push. Well, David, we could talk about this probably for another hour, but uh, unfortunately, I think we've come to the end for this month. Great talking to you. I, I love the new glasses. It's it's a great look. No more Thank blue you. reflection. Look forward to connecting with you next time. Sounds good, Mark. I appreciate it as always. Thanks, man. Bye-bye.